grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It somehow seems that every generation has that moment that defines it. And for a very long time, I thought my generation had perhaps escaped that. In generations past, it was, well, it was Pearl Harbor. And for others, it was the assassination of President Kennedy. And possibly for, for my generation, it was the Challenger explosion. But 15 years ago today, I think is the moment that defined this generation and, and redefined the world. Because on September 11th of 2001, almost 3,000 people were killed, and more than 6,000 injured. 265 souls on the four airplanes. 2,606 people in the World Trade Centers and the surrounding areas. And 125 at the Pentagon. It, it brought out in us, at first, I think, a wonderful thing. Because the first response was to care for one another to ask, what can I do to help those people in need? How can I help? How can I love my neighbor? And the second response, also right, was to look to the state, the state who bears the sword, who is God's authority here to curb evil and to punish wrongdoers, to look to the state for justice. And sometimes that desire then is twisted, it is exaggerated, and no longer we look for justice, but we look for vengeance. And we look for vengeance because these, these monstrous men have done monstrous deeds, things so horrible, so hateful, that it seems as if they've shed the very essence of humanity and taken upon themselves the person of the devil. But I don't want to talk to you today about monstrous men. I want to talk to you about radical redemption. For the more monstrous the man, the more superabounding the grace of Christ Jesus. St. Paul writes that he was a monstrous man. Before his conversion, St. Paul, or as he was then known, Saul, was on a mission for God. He had departed from Jerusalem to seek out, to punish, and to bring back to the temple for trial those idolaters, those blasphemers who would make a man God. And so he went from town to town, synagogue to synagogue, house to house, to seek out those Christians and to drag them by force and violence, to stand before the council in Jerusalem, to pay for their apostasy. But St. Paul was a monstrous man who received radical redemption. I received mercy for this reason, writes St. Paul, that in me as the foremost as the foremost sinner, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. 
There's a hymn in our, in our LSB, hymn 611, Chief of Sinners Though I Be, Jesus shed his blood for me, died that I might live on high, and lives that I might never die. As the branch is to the vine, I am his, and he is mine. For it's very easy to dehumanize these monstrous men, to define them by the vile and terrible things that they do. Uh, nonetheless, they, like you and I, have been made in the image of God, an image that was corrupted in the fall of Adam that is tainted, but yet retains a majesty among creation that is unparalleled. And these... These are who Christ came to save. For he says in the, in the Gospel of St. Luke, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And so you, brothers and sisters, you who have been called to repentance, you who have been washed clean in the blood of the Lamb, who have upon yourselves the image of Christ received in your baptism, we are now to be as he, to seek not the righteous and call them, but to call sinners to repentance, to proclaim the gospel, to tell those monstrous men of the love of God, of the sacrifice of Christ, of his resurrection, and their redemption in Christ Jesus. And we are to love our enemies, to love these monstrous men. St. Paul writes in Romans, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. It is the responsibility of the state to exercise its sword. And the sword has been given to the state to be a terror for those who would do evil and to be a defender of those who would do good. Luther wrote on the responsibility of the rulers or of the state as God's appointed authority, saying that the state exercises the sword so that the good may have outward peace and protection and that the bad may not be free to do evil in peace and quietness without fear. And while it is the role of the state to wield the sword, it is the joyous task of the church to exercise the gospel, to exercise another kind of sword, the spiritus gladius, or the sword of the spirit, the word of God. For this word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But for those of us who are being saved, it is the very power of God. Christ tells us that our Heavenly Father makes the sun to rise on the evil and on the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. In Matthew, he tells us, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. We are to pray for them, to pray that they would have the food they need, the water, the clothing, the house, the home, the job. We pray that they would have all things needful for body and life. And we pray that their ears may be opened to receive the gospel 
to receive the Holy Spirit and to receive Christ as their Savior, that they may be turned from monstrous men and made sons and daughters of God by radical redemption. It's not often that I make a, a book recommendation for you, but I have been reading a book that came to my mind when I thought of September 11th falling on a Sunday this year. It's called Mission at Nuremberg, an American Army Chaplain in the Trial of the Nazis. It's by Tim Townsend. It tells the story of an Army Chaplain of a Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod pastor who was assigned to be the chaplain to the monstrous men on trial at Nuremberg, the architects of the Holocaust. And this was the flock given to Henry F. Gericke, chaplain of the U.S. Army, pastor of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. Gericke writes, that he was terrified by the prospect of being close to the men who had tried to take over the world, would he have to shake their hands? He imagined that simply the feeling of breath on his face would be sickening. And how could he comfort these Nazis who has caused the, wor caused the world so much heartache? How could he minister to the leaders of a movement that had taken millions of lives? How could he form a spiritual bond with these men without getting in the way of whatever God had planned for them already. He had conducted hundreds of prison services. Gericke had a very, a very kind heart and was driven to reach in society those most rejected, those most in need of grace. But there were obvious differences, he writes, between the burglars of St. Louis and the mass murderers in Nuremberg. Now, of the 21 men that were to stand trial, 15 were Protestant. And when Chaplain Gerke went there and set up a chapel for these men and introduced himself to each of them, 13 of those seats were filled. The first prisoner he met was Rudolf Hess, and Gericke offered his hand. He was criticized by some for doing this, but he recalled that as he offered his hand, he did so in order that the gospel may not be hindered by any wrong approach. And furthermore, he was there as a representative of an all-loving father and recalled that God saves sinners like him. These men, he writes, must be told about the Savior bleeding, suffering, and dying on the cross for them. These monstrous men he ministered to for 11 months. At one point, there was a rumor that Gerke was going to be going home and all 21 of them wrote a letter, or at least signed a letter, addressed to his wife. They said, my dear Mrs. Gerke, your husband, Pastor Gerke, has been taking care of the religious undersigned. All 21 of them, including the Roman Catholics. He has been doing so for more than half a year. We have now heard, dear Mrs. Gerke, that you wish to see him back home. We understand this wish very well. Nevertheless, we are asking you to put off your wish to gather your family around you. Please consider that we cannot miss your husband now. Our dear chaplain Gerke is necessary for us, not only as a pastor, but as so thoroughly good a man that he is. We simply have come to love him. These Nazis had come to love their shepherd. 
In this stage of the trial, they write, it is impossible for any man other than him to break through the walls that have been built around us in a spiritual sense, even stronger than in a material one. Therefore, please leave him with us. We shall be deeply indebted to you. We send our best wishes to you and your family. God be with you. Six of his flock were given the death penalty to be hanged on October 16th, 11 months after Gerke had arrived. He walked each of these men to the gallows, except for Hermann Gehry, who had committed suicide in his own cell. And Gehring, Gehring yet rejected Christ despite all that Gerke had preached to him, had proclaimed to him. But Goering once told him, this Jesus that you're always speaking about, to me he is just another smart Jew. And Pastor Gerke did not commune him. And Hermann Goering took his life in his cell. Alfred Rosenberg was another man whom Gerke feels he did not touch. He did not commune him, for he did not hold to the Christian faith. But four of these men, four of these men, Gerke communed because they repented. They were confronted by their sin, and these monstrous men threw themselves at the feet of their Savior to be redeemed by Christ's blood and made our brothers and sisters. Wilhelm Frick received communion and before his hanging professed the faith publicly. Wilhelm Kietel received communion and before his hanging professed the faith publicly. Joachim von Ribbentrop received communion, and before his hanging, professed the faith publicly. And Fritz Saukel received communion, and before he was hanged, confessed the faith publicly. Chaplain Gerke left the service in 1950 and returned to life in the parish he was a pastor in Chester, Illinois at St. John Lutheran Church. He was also chaplain at Menard State Penitentiary. And on October 11, 1961, Chaplain Gerke at Menard State Penitentiary, leading a Bible study, suffered a heart attack and was called home. This chaplain, to some of the most monstrous men that this world has ever known was overcome by the grace of Christ Jesus that he may be for them the very person of Christ to call them to repentance and these chief of sinners like St. Paul Receive the overflowing, abundant love and mercy that is in Christ Jesus. That no sin, no sin that we commit can be overcome by the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. For he has come not to call the righteous, but to call sinners. Chief of sinners and even novices to repentance. And so today, brothers and sisters, we come to the table of the Lord to receive his true body and his most precious blood, to be joined in the sacramental union, in the mystical union of the people of God at this altar and at every altar where his name is confessed and with all the saints in heaven, those men uh, no longer monsters, but redeemed children of God. 
And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus.